live from a new Texas flavored apocalypse. This mm -hmm. is State of the Game. State of the Game is like is a trip through the world of music with the mirth and joy of Milo and Otis without killing animals, you know? <laughs> um, which they did a lot of in that movie. So uh, I am your host, statistician, dormant nymph, the uh, wood nymph, Dan Oak. And my, my co-host, as always, the Bucky Barnes to my Marquis de Sade, we're talking about <laughs> K. Diggy. Thank you for being here, sir. Um, as you know, K. Diggy, I am the kind of person who makes up slogans for people I've never met. <laughs> and I say them all the time whenever I'm mentioning that person, right? <laughs> uh, it's kind of my deal. So for our guest, what I always say is PQ, cleanest lines in the business. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. 100% of the time. Clean, he's, he's an artist, designer, and the when we're talking about clean lines, it's almost the equivalent of diction for a rapper. Mm. You know, the, if you can hear everything they're saying clearly, it takes it to another level. And if you look at PQ Designs, you're going to see, you, you see every line. It's beautiful. Um, done some of my favorite covers this year. Um, you know, honestly, going back to Raheem's Lament the compilation, Wrecking Crew compilation, uh, alternative stuff, which was mind-blowing. So I'm so glad to have him with us. Uh, yeah. How are things? Very good. First of all, I appreciate that. The, the clean lines is something I kind of pride myself in. Um, you know, we're we're working in a way I don't, I don't like to, I like, I just like clean design and, and, and clean art. So, um, Absolutely. but I also like to throw a bunch of stuff at the wall and, you know, see, but, but I think when you get that, it tightens everything up. So I appreciate that. Um, very good, very fortunate to be uh, working and being able to contribute to uh, more work in the last year and a half than I have in the previous 10 years before that. So um, very mm, fortunate, sure. and uh, I appreciate you guys having me on. It's it's incredible. It feels you like you feel like proof that we're in a golden age, like oh, that we're in a real high peak of hip hop, because uh, it's like hip hop is something that always kind of has prided itself on improving, right? Like, in, yeah. in on on building on what the lessons of the past were, and. Like, this is a great era for music. And part of that proof is that there's some great cover art. Uh, much better yes. than previous. Uh, and so let first, do we have any, K Diggy, do you have anything that comes to mind when you think of bad cover art for, for hip hop albums? Uh, I mean, if Drake's cover art, uh, that's supposed to come out for his album. If the if that room if that's his rumored cover art with the emojis of the pregnant women, uh, that would probably be oh. the worst I've seen in a decade. Um, oh, and then Kanye's, uh, I mean, I the black square uh, for the Donda album was just not a choice that I would have done if I were him. Let me try and uh, the one that the one that I remember as having gone off the rails, right? <laughs> um, and this is you say, I mean, sorry, with all this military memories, right? We'll go. This will be the only one that, like, the legend of Little Flip's Leprechaun album. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember seeing it laying around the barracks and people laughing and it's just a good, it's a good warning of like, this is what happens when your, your theme goes horribly wrong. Game over. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's funny though color. because that that to me it, i mean it, it's obviously not you know the, the most aesthetically pleasing thing in the world but honestly from a consumer standpoint if that if if they press that up on vinyl i feel like there would be a lot of people that would feel the need to own that on vinyl just based on that cover and that's not saying that it's 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 so artistic but you know what i mean it, it's it's just a novelty thing but yeah no it, it it's a great it's a valuable point art is strange in the sense that you like it gets bad right there's bad art but sometimes it's so bad it's brilliant yeah yeah it's, it's, so like they said, any reaction is better than no reaction. So, <laughs> absolutely. The uh, like, so, I, and I, I think I, too. Um... No, I'm, I'm prepping the next thing. You go, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think you know, like one of the things that uh, people reference as sort of like first stuff is. Um, people really take shots at the the whole like pen and pixel thing and you know the stuff that came from like cash money and master p and it, it did kind of become generic at a certain point but i feel like there's some people that could kind of flip that style and make it work and and make it look kind of cool and i think um i don't know i feel like the covers some of them are bad but some of them are kind of serving the project and i feel like that that pen and pixel stuff represents a certain era and a certain regional style so I'm, I'm not always as mad at it as other people are I, I, i'm not very snobby on the artistic side when it comes to the covers. So, i just do what i do and i like my stuff yeah so pq let me ask you what what makes a bad cover to you hmm um it's weird because i feel like I was I was on a podcast that I you know with with call out culture where we discussed uh, mm -hmm. some of the worst covers ever, right? And um, honestly, I think what's what's ironic is some of the worst covers came out of some of the best eras in music as, as oh. far as hip hop goes because when you trans from that some of that like to late 90s when people i think it was when artists were really transitioning to leaning on the on the computer and photoshop and the design software to do the work for them a lot of really shitty stuff came out of that and i think that led to um some of this stuff that was was around in the 2000s where it was just computer generated super generic um people just finding cracked versions of, of software and putting together a bunch of shitty stuff. And some of that shitty stuff was on what were probably pretty good albums. And, those, and, and that kind of, I think in the long run has made those albums suffer. So I think when you're dealing with, uh, you know, I, I think less can, less is more. It's, it's, Try to keep it simple and lean on things like bright colors and things like. And I think that'll do your album a lot more justice than trying to throw everything at the wall, which is what you know you see on a lot of like really shitty mixtapes or like event flyers and things like that. And it just yep. you know it, it kind of becomes a jumbled mess. Mm -hmm. Yep. No, I, it, I looked up. There was like a in the hip hop golden era site or whatever had this list of bad mixtapes uh, of the bad covers. And I was like, I disagree. Like, they, this is the one that they always talk about when they talk about the worst No Limit covers. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is Big Bear doing things. And I think this cover is awesome. Uh, well, I'm definitely not mad at it now. I mean... <laughs> It's, it's it's fun to look at and you know it it's not taking itself too seriously so i'm not mad at it 
I mean, the bear is tipping the but glass. I, I mean, that's that's hilarious. <laughs> you know, have fun. See, I think the things that make some of these covers so assy is you know you see it, it's really the text that kind of ruins the party. Because everything point. else is kind of fun. Like it's when you have that glow around the text and you have like where it says big bear and that's being bent. That's just like simple stuff that you could figure out in Photoshop in the first three minutes of learning the program. And I feel like that's what happens. People do that stuff and they think it looks good and they lean on that. And then that's what makes it kind of wonky in the long run. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah the but you, I mean, you must've heard, um, I don't know if it was on Colin Culture or somewhere else, but Woods, Billy Woods said that he doesn't want lettering on his covers at all. Mm -hmm. He he wants yeah. it to be like the picture is the thing. Um, yeah. And I think that's, it's clean and clear for his merch, right? It's, it's if you've got the right cover, it does everything for you. Uh, that's, it's, that's been in my mind for a while. Uh, of like, should it be lettering or no letter, right? Is there is there a rule to go by? See, I don't think there's universal rules. And I think, you know, that if you're going to go with with that guidelines, first of all, I, I think it, it should fit the artist. And that most certainly fits Woods. Right, right. Um, I've done covers where it's all lettering because it's illustrated letters and things like that. And then there's things where, I mean, there's a lot of jazz covers where um, you go back to them and it's just a very, very clean, simple image and then very simple, clean text on top of it. And it does the job. Right. I don't think that there's any universal rule. It, I, I think that the cover should sort the story of the album. Yep. And it, so if, when that works, it works. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. And I, I mean, I don't think lettering is really essential anymore because not, not a lot of people are buying CDs anymore. And I think the lettering in the past was so you could, when you went to, you know, Best Buy or Tower Records, wherever you bought your music from, you would be able to identify the CD. Yeah. Uh, but now they're just all pixels and, uh, or JPEGs in, you know, the iTunes or Tidal or Spotify. So, you, you, I mean, you already know, you don't need to know what the cover looks like to listen to the album. Yeah, I, I think that uh, there's a couple ways to look at that. So you use Drake before as an example with the emoji cover, right? Mm -hmm. So Drake, his whole model for how he releases his music is basically rebuilt around streaming. I know some of his stuff has, you know, come out on physical just because some people want to own it and they can put it, you know, they can press his stuff up on vinyl and put it in an Urban Outfitters or something like that. Right, but right. for the most part, Drake is relying on uh, streaming. So he, for, for, to essentially Drake's cover art, it doesn't matter. Like it, it really doesn't matter because his stuff is made to where He's not even really making albums like as a, as a cohesive piece of work. He's making his albums are basically 20 singles that can, you know, reach out to all different markets on streaming. He doesn't need cover art at all. Most people are just going to be taking his stuff and putting it on their playlist. And then that's going to serve its purpose. Whereas you take somebody like Woods. Somebody like um, you know, West Side Gun, mm. vinyl culture thrives on those artists. So I think that that's something where it's why artists are getting, like myself, are getting more work now than we were 10, 15 years ago. Because if people are going to drop this stuff on vinyl, and it's no secret that the vinyl prices are much higher than they were in 1997, um, right. people are going to be, some people are selling their vinyl for $300 a pop. So if you're going to put something out and you're going to release your music on that, you better have some good artwork. Um, you, mm. you should be showing that you're investing in yourself, in the artist, you're working on a look and a, and a certain ethos to your music. I shouldn't be saying that you should, 
it generally serves the person that's doing that. Uh, it's it's just smarter to do. It's 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 putting more into your product, and it's going to have longevity. And I think that's where the peop- the the artists, I'm saying, rappers or musicians that are investing in the visual art are able to thrive more in the vinyl era. Um, this vinyl era, this little you know, this hip hop mm-hmm. underground renaissance that we're right. living in now, it serves more. Yeah, Katie, uh, as an example here, I wanted to throw up uh, this. Th- I mean, this is some real memorable work here. Uh, on This is Wrecking Crew's Steel's Kitchen release. Uh, this is PQ did this. And mm-hmm. this is an amazing thing, right? With all the, the wording and the letters fitting into the 40 bottle. Uh, and being a part of the story of the album connecting to the movie Juice, right? So, like, Drake isn't looking for this. Drake right. is looking for a, a reasonably memorable Avi, right? Like, it's just, like, Avi-sized, right? So when you click on your streaming service, that tiny picture comes up, and you remember it, right? All it's got to do is be that memorable, but it doesn't have to be this memorable. If that makes sense. So and PQ, do you want to go like what was the process of designing that cover? For that particular Steel's Kitchen cover, well, first of all, I should say that the guys in the wrecking crew, um, they all I think have a certain they're they're all definitely skilled at pointing out a certain aesthetic on a lot of things. So, so all of those guys, um, and I've had a relationship with some of those guys for a long time. So, um, when I did the first cover, I've been aware of them since they formed and, you know, have, have been in touch, especially with Zilla Rocca. Um, and he, Zilla has always had a very good attention to detail when it comes to aesthetics for his projects when he releases them. Right. So obviously the, the wrecking crew is a play on the movie Juice. Um, I did their first compilation, uh, you know, uh, Rahim's Lament back in summer of 2020. So that was gonna be a take on on Juice in a certain way. They gave me the reference of what they wanted in there and I was in communication with them on what they wanted. So we did that. And then when we did this uh, one for Steel's Kitchen, they gave uh, Dan. Would you be able to put that share your screen again? Yeah, I, I was going to show the Raheem's lament. Okay. Right yeah, that's the yeah. PQ version. Yep. Yeah, and actually, the the original version, I, I you know they provided the photo for me, and I laid that out for them. So mm-hmm. I, I've actually worked with them on a lot of that. But then when it got to Steel's Kitchen, um, they moved on to. They wanted it to be a play on the opening titles for Ozark. So they wanted to use that SK in the very simple font um, and then have these small icons that were uh, representative of Steele's Kitchen. So you have, you know, the bacon and eggs, you have the ketchup, um, you have the, the 40 bottle. And then I was just really... I had already drawn the 40 bottle and I had, you know, I had given them the artwork and we were good to go. And then this illustrated 40 bottle with the typography, uh, the hand-drawn typography, that was something I kind of just did messing around um, afterwards because I really liked, I just liked how it looks. I liked taking an icon like that that can tell a story and then sort of building around it and just adding details that, you know, kind of just spruces it up a little bit. And um, I sent it over to them and, you know, uh, both uh, Curly Castro and Zilla said, we have to somehow use this for something because this is, you know, it, it, it just looks dope. Um, so that kind of, that was sort of the secondary thing that came after the, um, after the, the main art, the main art was really that SK, the Ozark thing. 
and then this this forty bottle was kind of brought in later on. That's awesome. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, I, I, it was interesting. Uh, I would say to to everybody when I was putting together my list of my favorite album covers uh, of this year, it really taught me what I'm looking for in an album cover. Uh, and I hadn't thought about it really in terms of the components. Um, I basically either want like art, you know what I mean? Like something yeah. that is uh, that kind of takes your breath away artistically from a painting standpoint, right? Uh, or I want something that is kind of just simple and you. Uh, it, like, okay, Diggy, I got to show you this. This is fun. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see here if I can. What is this called? Oh, there it is. The album is called Good Dick and Weed. That's right. <laughs> Ebony. And she is just. I'm going to actually Google this. What are you going to do? All right. I like the cover. It's her in the bathroom. Just, you know. Living her life. I just think that's memorable as hell to me. <laughs> so that's the other kind of art, right? So it, I either want something like this or I want, uh, you know, uh, let me see here. August um, there you go. Jinx did this. Phenomenal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's one of my favorite things to look at. Uh, it's stupendous. Horned Monk, August Fanon, Iceberg Theory. When he when I first saw this, I was like, you've got to merch up now. Like, this is crazy. You know, this yeah, cover, yeah. you've got to put it everywhere. Um, because the, the detail in that face you can lose yourself in so those are the kind of two variances that I, I really want something that's that's either you know a, a real work to look at or something that's kind of off kilter and personal if that makes sense mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i think too something to be said for both of these is for the um the first one for ebony good dick and weed there, even though that you know, like you said, it's it's her <laughs> living her life, but you there is some like compositional value to that photo. Uh, the fact that the the image is sort of, um, you know, there's there's the predominant just you know the, like the white color palette in there. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. things that stand out. The photo pops, and then when you have the the simple uh, script handwritten text on top, that does add value. And then when you get to the horned monk, obviously, and I'm, you know, th this goes back to where it should fit the artist. So whenever I see a project, especially involving uh, August Fanon, I think, you know, this is going to be a very complete body of work. So I feel like, you know, a more artistic cover serves the projects that he produces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I so I look at art with my son all the time, right? Just to kind of sharpen his analysis skills, right? He's eight years old. So the first thing I ask him every time, it's the same question every time, is what was the first thing your eye went to, right? What was the first thing you saw when you looked at that uh, picture? And the first thing when I see Good Dick and Weed, I'm like, she's got a towel on? What? And, and that pulls you in. I'm, like, I'm interested yeah. in that, right? Uh, another cover in this vein for me. Uh, um, yes. Let me see. There you go. Yeah. So that's like, you know, you're seeing him on the bed. You're seeing the lady. But then there's Bear. <laughs> There's a bear on the side, really catches you. And then there's dogs, and you're like, there's dogs. It, there's a lot going on in this. I really enjoy that. Not everybody can do this cover, you know? No, but that's, 
and, and you know, but the way that the colors are involved, the way that that light is coming in, it it's a beautiful cover. It's oh, beautifully yeah. shot, and um, you know, it, it's 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 definitely there's a mood set as soon as you see that. It's 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 a nice cover. I like it. Yeah, no, it, it's it's one of my favorites, and it's like, yeah, it, it's weird because I don't think some covers you know you love immediately, right? Let me get uh, this is uh, one of my favorites, Sleep Sinatra. Oh yes, uh, yeah, Sleep Sinatra and Glorious, Sleep Gloriously. Uh, I love this one. This. This is just something that's always taken my breath away. I don't know if yeah. it's an old painting or not, uh, but it's incredible. And some of those you know right away. Some covers become your favorite covers over time because you stare into them and they kind of grow with you. Um, so that's, I think both are, are valuable. Yeah. Yeah. As some of these you do just want to, you know, you want to like, that's a, that's a painting that I would want to have on my wall. It's just, well, it's just a well done cover. And again, that lends itself to sleep's music very well. Oh yeah. Yeah. The depth of it, right. You know, the, you've got dark brown textures, you've got, there's light, but it's far away, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not black and bleak and like, heavy metal or anything like that but it is deep it is deep and yeah and the shadow um yeah yeah there's details so that yeah i think you're right this really does fit the artist part of the reason it fits him so well um okay diggy do you have do you have what do you what were your favorite uh covers of the year we could throw some of yours in the, in the mix oh covers of the year um Man, I I really liked the let's see, let me pull them up. Let's see what I have. I mean, so, I, I really uh enjoyed the Igor cover. Uh is from that, Tyler the Creator. Or are you talking about the, the new the new title? I'm not I'm sorry, not Igor. Uh call me if you get lost. I'm sorry. Call me if you get lost, yes. Um Call me and, if you get lost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, right. I, right. No, I get it. What I, I appreciated about it, and this is like a detail that I found out a little bit later, uh, and it just shows how much he cares, is like you see the blueprint on the the card, I guess. Yeah. So each, each streaming service had a different color uh, blueprint based on like the predominant color of uh, the streaming service. So I think Spotify had like a green, green uh, print. Uh, and then iTunes had the blue print. Uh, and I think Tidal may have had a purple. But for me, like that just shows, it's, it's like that attention to detail and the craft that I want to see from my artist. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I want my artist to care about the cover. You know, I want them to care about the presentation and not just uh, presenting something haphazard. Like, I think for me, like, uh, my va I, value, uh, I value details and I hate when things are done haphazardly or half-assed. So mm -hmm. this was one of my favorite covers just because of that attention to detail uh, that, that Tyler showed. I think that Tyler, um, I mean, I think he's brilliant in every sense, uh, what, you know, musically, aesthetically. Um, and I feel like he's, Kay Diggy, what you were saying, you know, like how you want them to care. I mm -hmm. think Tyler cares about every possible detail mm -hmm. of his project and how to roll out. And I think he always has from, from the very beginning of Odd Future, from when they had, you know, their Tumblr page um they, they just i think he was in control of how that vision was executed the entire time so i think it, it's no different when it comes to um call me if you get lost and that i didn't know that about the streaming services like switching up the color it makes perfect sense and is brilliant 
and 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 the weird thing about PQ is like when you heard it, you weren't surprised in any way. It was Not like, oh, of course he would do that. Of course Tyler would would have a new yeah. cover for Um But it's also it's very hip hop in the sense that it's it's his version of Old Dirty Bastards, uh, dirty version album cover, but mm-hmm. it his version it can't be mistaken for the original right right it's a different aesthetic it's different details uh no one's ever going to say he ripped it off right he yeah. paid tribute to it and he put new life into into that um, absolutely so that's that's really cool um uh, i mean how do you feel thank you about my theory that i i gave in the breakdown which is basically that Back in the 90s, during some of the best periods of hip-hop, the premier artists just weren't thinking about covers. They were on giant labels with million-dollar videos, and they kind of didn't care, and some guy did it. You know? Uh, I think that's very true to form. Um, you know, I think when, when there were major labels whether it was a so-called underground artist on a major label or whether it was just, you know, a a quintessential mainstream artist. And I'm speaking in general senses. I'm not saying everybody, but um, yeah, I think that part of their thing was when you're afforded certain luxuries as a, as an artist, you can get your, you know, you see it at every possible level. Um, these guys, you know, you hear these stories of having like a full entourage in the studio or just paying for a car service and just renting that car service the entire day, you're going to take advantage of it. Right. And, and, and realistically, I think something that should be noted too, with, with a lot of that is like a lot of these, a lot of these major label artists, you know, hip hop was younger back then. So a lot of these guys, you know, when Nas was making Illmatic, he was a child so like he's not gonna he's not gonna have the full vision to want to know what all of this stuff is and then also i think when you can now too is like have say if an artist comes out now and especially in the in the independent music scene um th- there's such a wide range age-wise in the art right right so you have guys that are in this independent scene that are 22 you have guys that are, there's more of a vocabulary of seeing the mistakes of what some of these guys have done over the last 25, 30 years. So you get to see how, oh, some of my favorite albums have shitty covers. I want to make something great. The other thing, too, I would throw in there is, um, you know, as you mentioned before, it's like when you're doing the stuff yourself and you're trying to sell your music and you have somebody like West Side Gun who is very upfront saying, this is more than music. This is a whole art curation that we're presenting now. You want to have your covers look a little bit more artistic and you have easy access to a lot of artists through Instagram and social media and stuff. But I think, yeah, those major labels, these guys were able to show up and rap. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and, and to give K Diggy, to give you a better sense of it, it's not that everyone was shitty back then. Right. Or like the, all the covers were shitty. Right. Like it's that in being an independent artist was so rare. It was such a rare thing. Right. People would be like, E40's independent. Like people would say it like like they were a monster or something. Because everyone was on a major label, you know? So some of my favorite rappers never had an important album cover. It's not that it was bad. It just never was important, right? So let me pull up as an example, right? <laughs> Look up AZ album covers, right? <laughs> None of these are terrible, really. Maybe Nine Lives. I, I'm not a big fan of that one. But these are just covers. They're just yeah. there. You know? Pieces of a Man is probably the, my favorite of the covers. Um, which is this one. But it's... Most of these are just fine. They're just whatever. Yeah. So to be a great artist and have never had a great album cover... 
can be a bummer for your audience. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and I think uh, that to make a great cover as an artist, you really have to understand what you're trying to say on the album and what you're really trying to communicate. Uh, and, and I think like a lot of, you know, a lot of artists when they're creating albums, they're just trying to create songs. It, there's not an overarching theme to it. Right. Uh, so that, that loss of vision for their music also translates to their, their cover because they don't know what they want their cover to, to symbolize because they don't know what their album actually means. Right. Yep. Yeah, no, it, it's it so I just think it's it's the mixtapes was was a real chaotic scene for cover <laughs> art. Um yeah. There was a lot of terrible, terrible mixtape covers. Uh, but there was one that changed my whole shit. Um uh, I think about it all the time. The uh, see if I can get it going. So this is the it's uh, pull it up. We let's see if I can do this. Cold Lloyd Banks Cold Corner Two. I'm gonna do it here, but it's it's a it was a gif. I had never seen an album cover that was a GIF, right? It was Lady Liberty with the hands, <laughs> crying into the hands, but the snow was actually falling. Oh. That's cool. I was that. That fucked me up. When I first saw that, I was like, not ready for that. I was like, you could do that? You can have a GIF <laughs> as your album cover? Yeah, that's crazy. And that's that could only happen in the world of mixtapes, right? Like nobody's yeah. gonna agree to that anywhere else. So it was that's kind of encapsulates the you know the highs and the lows of these mixtapes. Like if you yeah. get like uh, let's do But you know, we should say too, if even if that wasn't a gif and that was just you know a, a still image, pretty good mixtape cover. Right? No, I hear mm -hmm. Conceptually. So this is like one of the other extremes. <laughs> OJ the Juice Man got the juice. So the, you had it all over the place. You had the good, the bad, and the ugly in the world. Yeah. The but there were no rules, and everybody was just throwing stuff at the wall. Um, I think it was necessary, right? It was necessary uh, because the labels had become too tight with, with what could happen. <laughs> Mm. Yeah. And it's it's it fits the era. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, that's the first time we were really seeing a flood of music. Right. And right. people were just throwing a lot of shit out. And then um, when that, you know, then then you see it flip back the other way. So now people can kind of put out, you know, I don't think people were prepared to digest as much music and just content in general that time um you know now we go on instagram and we see we're ju we just we're viewing other people's content all day mm -hmm. when we're going on instagram and twitter and our, i i think like we've kind of adapted to that so now that's caught up to itself and now we can see all right somebody can put out three albums per year as opposed to one album every two years and those albums aren't lacking in quality from that so that this ecosystem can just kind of produce its own stuff and, um, and have things that, you know, quality is not lacking. Good stuff is coming out. I mean, the last five years have been incredible for just music in every lane of music in general um, has been really quality and good art production lyrics yeah no and, and it's 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 part and parcel of now that people are more independent uh artists are kind of wary to sign to labels what remember when like jay was trying to sign joey badass and joey badass said i don't want to sign to you i want to be you mm. uh, and that's 
you know, that's how a lot of people either think or they're just kind of yeah. happy with their thing. But either way, they're taking more time and effort to build every aspect of the album. Oh, here we go. Simple, beautiful, brilliant cover. Let's show this here. He's going to come in and come out. Bang. Have you ever seen this one, Keith? I have not. Oh, I love this one. It's a fun album, too. I dig this album. Uh, yeah. It's, it, yeah. What's, what's the name of uh, the, the name of the album? The Color Blue? Yes. And the, the artist uh -huh. is D2X. D2X. And that's a point that, you know, I, I would make is that, like, I've never heard this album but I should be able to, you know, describe the album, the album music-wise, without without ever hearing it, just by looking at the cover. Yep. No. It, um, it, calling it the color blue and and leaning into that, I think it's the the title track as well. Uh, he really had an aesthetic planned out. So. Yeah, an aesthetic, and I mean. You've heard the album, obviously. Oh, yeah. But oh, yeah. I, I'm guessing, I've never heard it. I'm guessing that, you know, it's a little bit lighthearted, a little bit mm -hmm. nostalgic, uh, you know, and a little bit, I guess you could say, cool. Yeah, no, it is. It, it, and it, there's ba basketball is an actual part of it, and it's about growing up. And yeah, yeah it's, it's just really, it's, and, and I love, the weird thing about this, the thing I love most about this cover is that there's no faces, right? Yes. The fact that there's no faces makes you really look at the movements, right? And the characters in the cover and where they're going and what they're doing. Uh, it's, it's and, it, and it allows you to project into the cover as well. Like you can... You right. know, you cannot put yourself in that situation. Yeah. You with us again, PQ? I am, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, and I think something on this that's really cool is the fact that it's, you know, color blue. It's got a lot of, like, the sort of, like, monochrome, a lot of negative space with the blue. And then each figure is a tone of blue but then it allows like the you know the warmer colors the reds and oranges to pop out um mm -hmm. i didn't see i didn't uh never saw this cover before you sent it to me and when i was looking at it, i was like man this is a good one i actually want to kind of explore that kind of thing where it's a lot more negative space and a lot more stripped down than what i normally do yeah no the, the my favorite the anti-color blue uh, would be like the PQ anti-version of this is one of my favorite colors in the covers of the year, Message to You, right? So Message to You is just ornate, right? This is like Game of Thrones shit, you know? Uh, it's, it's dazzling. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff going on, but... Like he said, the negative space can sometimes really set it off, uh, but the opposite of that can be beautiful and brilliant as well. Yeah, and I think for something like that, uh, for message to you, um, that was actually, you know, as far as like I like taking art direction from somebody, especially if the artist has a vision. And Brain Orchestra is brilliant with that. He, I mean, he's, same thing as we were saying to Tyler, he has a full scope, a full vision of how he wants to roll everything out. Um, so when him and I started talking, he just basically said, he gave me the album title and he said, I want you to flip my logo in your style. So when somebody gives me that and it's something as simple as their logo and they want me to do it, then, you know, my first reaction is, all right, they want me to take something simple and add a ton of detail to it. 
Right. Um, so we just right. establish a color palette and then we just, you know, it's, it's off to the races. And a lot of times I think in what I really like about this era that we're in right now is you can take artists that would typically not have, and, and I, I apologize that I keep going back to Griselda and West Side Gun, but I think that West Side Gun has taken something that was done sort of in Detroit in the 2000s where these guys had like very street centered content, but it was also very artistic. And, right. uh, you know, cause they, cause they have, you know, that's a reality in Detroit from, from the, the lyricism there, but then they also have that Dilla influence where you can kind of go a little bit left of center. And I feel like people have really done that in, and that's sort of a common theme in, in this era that we're in. So you can take some of that and it really gives me like a, it's a very like psychedelic look of how these guys present their stuff. A lot of the way that they do their beats, a lot of the way that the producers are doing their production and these guys are rhyming. It's a really cool juxtaposition. So I like to add that little psychedelic um, sort of flair to what they're doing. And that's what I did with brain. So let, let me ask, cause you mentioned color palette. What is the significance or what is the importance of choosing the correct color palette for the album? Like, and using this, like using this example, using this album as an example, like why was Brown chosen? Um, so I approach these different ways and, you know, so, sometimes it, there's not a lot of rules in this. I don't, I'll never claim to have, you know, some people will say like, some artists say they have, uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce it, but is it synthesis? Right. Where really? some, yeah. Yeah. I do not claim to have that. Um, and I think a lot of, to, to be honest with you guys, I think a lot of the people that claim to have it are probably, I think a lot of people are full of shit when they say they have it. <laughs> I think, I think, um, but I think some people, some people definitely do have it. Um, but I think sometimes I rely on the artist. So most times that an artist reaches out to me, 90% of the time, the, what they've seen from me is on Instagram and they will send, and I'll, I'll say to them, unless they just tell me to do my thing. Um, I, how can I say this? Sometimes you can it's not, they're, they're not completely in sync. You can just give somebody a piece of art sometimes. And then it's like, it's sometimes it either works or it doesn't. With Brain, he had seen a couple pieces that I did in this palette before. So he suggested that. And he said, I like this. And um, I think he actually said he wanted uh, different tones of beige. And then I had shown him a couple things that I had done before. And then, you know, cause it had those couple tones of like that, that uh, greenish color in there. And then that uh, kind of burgundy color. And he liked that. So that's what I started with. So I had that palette, I had his logo and then I just went from there. Yeah, no, that's, that's interesting. The um, yeah, no, he, it, it's a, it's, a spellbinding work and I really enjoy it. The um, so yeah, thank you. Give me something that that hit you that you weren't involved in the cover cover that you love. Okay, um, something that I really really loved this year um, was the Flea Lord and DJ Mugs project, uh, Ram LZ. Oh, mm, I don't know. I'll probably misspell it. Oops. No, but that's that's it. This cover is amazing. Yeah. I love this cover. So, so th this holds a lot of significance for me. One, because this cover, I think, is sort of like very representative of this era that we're in and really why we're having this conversation. Because this is done by, um, by Sepp. Seppington, who, you know, for those that don't know, he's the one that he's, he created the Fly God art and he's by far, I mean, cover artist, by far the, 
the most known in this underground movement that we're in. And I think this is sort of a, um, uh, it's a collision of like three of the biggest entities in this movement because for Sep, there's some pieces that he does where his art is almost the star of the show on the project. Um, not, I mean, in this, I think it's equal parts because Flea Lord is coming off a, a crazy 2020, releasing sure. a new project every month. And right. then when he's linked with DJ Muggs, who's, you know, probably one of the top three most successful hip hop producers of all time. Right. And the fact that Muggs is, you know, for the past four or five years has really uh, lent himself to the underground, him linking with Flea Lord and then applying Sep's art and then using what's cool about this too is it, it, it's a callback to anybody that doesn't know Ram LZ is, a, a, you know, an amazing eccentric artist from the, be, you know, kind of the beginnings of hip hop. So when you add all of these things together, I think... Just the art itself is amazing. The album is amazing. And then just what it means culturally is incredible. So and Nick, K. Diggy, to, to prove his point uh, of what he was talking about, right? Remember when I pulled up AZ's covers and they bored us to tears? Uh, <laughs> instead, look at Flea Lord's covers, dude. You know, we're, we're seeing just all kinds of interesting art from flea lord and it's not he it's not that he's a visionary art guy the, the way that tyler is but flea lord is an incredible planner mm -hmm. he's great at planning what he wants to do and so you get stuff like rock america which is just an unforgettable cover like Flea Lord knows how to center what he's doing uh, and, and make sure all the best people are involved. Now, when he's talking about West Side Gun, he's talking about Sep. I, di I didn't know, Katie, if you had seen the original Fly God cover. No. It's, wow, that's a great. Yeah, it's the most, to me, it's the most important like cover art in Griselda history right uh, this to me set the stage is this Sep who did this you're saying yes yeah so it's just beautiful and scary <laughs> at the same time yeah. and that's exactly what they wanted to do yeah and I think uh, culturally for what this represents to this lane of underground hip-hop that I'm mostly involved in this is the Clash London Calling cover. You know what I mean? It's it's uh, oh, it's the it's it's the Wu Tang logo. It's the Black Flag logo. It's it's the thing that's representative of everything that is going on now, which is you know just very grimy, street centered hip hop, but that has some like very left of center production that's influenced by everything from Alchemist to Mad Lib. And then it has, you know, a, a very aesthetically pleasing cover. I mean, that's sort of, honestly, this cover is, you can trace it back to the reason why I'm working in this lane right now. So all praise is due to that cover. All praise is due to Sep, you know, very important. Yeah. I just didn't want to talk Sep without talking about this cover. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, you know, so that was, uh, yeah, it's, it's cool. And so give me uh, give me another one, Kay Diggy. Um wow for tw twenty twenty one. Um one that kind of stood out to me, it's a little bit older. Uh I did like the Awaken My Love cover from Charles Gambino. Gambino okay. We're, we're talking kind of negative space again, right? We're talking about yeah. the the blues and the whole deal. Yep, yep. I don't want to get into it anyway. That's fine. So yeah, that's and but and I and the cover to me when I saw this cover of the Walmart, 
Walmart.com. The I'm <laughs> buying vinyl on Walmart.com. So the the thing about it to me was I instantly clicked because I hadn't ever liked the Childish Gambino cover art this much. Right. Right. Yeah. Camp, whatever, you know, all the stuff is is fine. This to me was a level of beautiful and thoughtful that I was like, okay, now it's time to look at this. This needs to be reviewed, right? Right. Um, and this was, and you could argue this was the the album that turned him into a cultural icon. This absolutely. was the album where he, he elevated to, you know, uh, the Grammy. Uh, this is, you know, this is America level talent that he's recognized as now. And I think the cover really had a lot to do with it. Yeah. No. Yeah. I think too, something that's really um, important about this cover is, you know, after you know what the, what the music sounds like. Um, it's almost like that music and this cover could have existed in 1976. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, it, it, it's, it's very timeless. And, you know, because he was really tapping into that whole, you know, psychedelic funk and soul um, sound, this cover fits that perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it, you know, he knew his theme at that point. He knew what he was doing. And he had been so scattered before that in terms of organizing his kind of thoughts mm -hmm. uh, that I just, I just thought it was really important. We're talking. And I'm, I mean, and it just speaks to me, it just speaks to the power of a cover uh, and how one great, uh, one great cover can elevate an artist's stature. Uh, and, and the covers can hold and can hold you back as well. But, uh, you will not be, if you want that level of prestige, that level of recognition, you have to put in thought and craft into your covers. There's no other way around it. Right. The music, the music's important, but the cover is could be argued is almost is just as important as the music that the the artist makes. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think ideally you wouldn't even be able to distinguish between them, right? Ideally yes. it is what it is the consistency of that. Um I think you see that with the great covers, right? They kind of feel like they come out of the album. Uh, and yeah, no it, it's it's important the um, I was gonna say negative space. I had to shout out FME contributor Big Flowers, who released Big Smile this year, mm -hmm. and I love this cover. Um, and the the you know obviously I you know I've been told this the the wonderful Malcolm Hex uh, LSP who did my logo was explained that usually we start with white and black because it's identifiable it pops right uh, and certainly this pops uh, it's also very contained so you can put it on a pillow uh, you can put it you know on a toothbrush you can put it all over the place because it's it's easy to design and redesign because it's it's mobile in that sense. Yeah, yeah, you can pluck that off. It's it's not like the art on the main cover is extending out to the edges of the of the thing. So it's it's essentially a very detailed logo almost where you can just pluck that and put it on different things. And yeah, I mean that that negative space always works. It, it's it's always a good idea and. I'm saying that and I should probably take my own advice every once in a while because I usually completely get rid of the negative space. But yeah, this is, this is great. No, it's hard, man. It's almost like, uh, you know, pausing on stage or something. Pausing on stage is really hard to do because yeah. 
you, you know, it can be, it can feel awkward. Uh, but yeah. Uh, do you have anything, any, any other ones you want, you thought of uh, PQ for this? Yeah. Yeah. I actually have a one that, um, well, you know what? I, could I give you two? Because they're, they're two different things. So sure, they go, speak to what go. you brought up before the, the yep. one is um, and it's, it, it's important to me because of the people that are featured on this compilation, they all kind of really embrace the artistic, um, like illustrated cover. But when it was curated from this on this person, it was kind of the opposite. And that's the, um, the Peter Rosenberg Real Late album. Ooh. And it touches into, you know, that it, it's just a really, really well executed photo. That's a good, we haven't really done the kind of cityscape thing. Uh, and I think this is a good one for that. Let me. Yeah. I mean, obviously to me, the, the move to make this, to give the border, the black border, to have the lettering match the overarching color of the city mm -hmm. is really it's really a smooth deal. Uh, yeah. I just, I, yeah, I, I hadn't thought about it as one of mine, but it's, it makes total sense. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, the other thing too, that's really cool about this is uh, Rosenberg, you know, he's obviously not making the beats on this album. He's not like, he's not doing any of the actual, He's really just curating. He's pulling like the DJ Khaled, but he's doing it very well. But part of the story that's involved in this is that he's taking this underground lane and what he's done the past two, three years is really elevated some of these super independent artists and they're getting play on Hot 97. So it kind of just speaks to what is going on right now and sort of tells this story that, you know, this it's, it's New York. And it's a cool thing because it's like New York is still here. It's, you know what I mean? Everything's lit up and it, it's something that really applies to what's gone on in the past couple of years. So I, I like that quite a bit. Yeah, he could have easily taken a picture of himself sitting on a giant throne and just done, done what we expect these things. Yeah. <laughs> but he, this, there's a clear message here, right? Of like, this is for us, right? Yeah. This is, we're all like, if you love New York rap, like this is it. I'm putting that in the forefront. Uh, yeah. I, I think that's a really smart decision. Can, can, have you seen this? No, I, I haven't, but that's like a breathtaking uh, nope. cover. No, that's, that, that's obviously an image, right? Yeah, that's just a breathtaking image. I would yep. say. Yeah. You know, just helicopter shot and probably, you know, just the lighting played with to really pump out that that green tone to it. No, it, it's it's weird because I think I there was a point, there's a point where like everyone thought they were a photographer. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and it, and I, I, I bit my tongue. I didn't want to say anything, but like it, it's, <laughs> and by the way, it's the opposite with art, right? Like whenever you bring up art to a normal person, they, they're like, I don't know anything about art. You know, I, I, I can't speak on that art. You know, that's complicated. You know, uh, nobody feels they're qualified to talk about art uh, in, in, where I am. But like photography, everybody felt like they were a photographer right but <laughs> the vision to know the right the right place for everything and to see it the the eye is something you can't replace yeah uh, and and yeah that's a great example what was the what was the next one you had okay so this one um it is called wino willy and the title is Welcome Home, Brother Willie. Welcome Home, Brother Willie. Oh, is this the grilled cheese stuff? Yes. Oh, so, 
Sure. So this this one is a big deal for me because, um, you know, grilled cheese is these guys are they're an artistic powerhouse. Yeah. Um, but I don't think they they don't get the shine that they deserve sometimes in this underground. And Wino Willie is he, he's actually based in Louisiana now. Um but he's from Philadelphia and he uh, has a very, very like, you know, boom bap sound, but it's, but there's more going on. There's a lot of texture to what he does and uh, shout out to Ryan Puma. This, this cover is hand painted. There's nothing, the, the entire thing is painted by hand by Ryan Puma. Um, and is this the, do I have this one? Is yes. This, is, yeah, yeah, that's the one. That's the one. So it's, okay. you know, you're, you're bringing in, seeing that, that Sun Ra image and just uh, blending all of these together. It's, like I said, it, it, my covers usually start out hand-drawn and then I bring them in to the computer and then I, I, I finish them at. This cover by Ryan Puma is front to back drawn by hand and then paint it by hand oh. um and the thing that's cool is like almost every grill she release ryan puma is sort of the visual identity for everything that they do that's so, what I, um, I was gonna i was gonna bring that up man because i i've got to give uh k diggy an understanding of how deeply dope all of these covers are like just to go project by project there's you know, dude riding a tiger on a wave. Ebenezer <laughs> Maxwell, great. I bought that one. That one's great. <laughs> it's amazing. Then you, you go to the grilled cheese party. Uh, but obviously the one that I stumbled upon that is the like underwater pyramids is just crazy. Oh. Absolutely nuts. Yeah, yeah, man. R Ryan Puma is a beast and he's, he's got a very, uh, I don't know how to, he, he's just highly skilled and then pairs that with being unbelievably original. And that's kind of what this grilled cheese party label is about. Um, and right. that's what their MCs are. That's what, you know, the, everything that they do is super on point. Mark Speck has unbelievable vision and what he wants to do with with this label um and it's you know just like in the same as griselda this is same thing it's a very curated art movement that they're pushing here and they've been around for a long time mark speck was around long long time yeah rapping in like 2000 with uh, some of the best mcs uh yeah he was let me see i gotta get some mark speck album cover stuff here to show because yeah he definitely had his own vision before you know this grocery party was a deal look at machete vision yeah oh <laughs> and then mark speck and blockhead great album keep playing <clears throat> he just had he always had a knack for what he wanted to look like right absolutely yeah, no, it's just always really interesting and identifiable stuff. Uh, yeah, Bandcamp Friday's coming up. Stock up on the Grilled Cheese Party. <laughs> and, and they only, but shout out to them. If they release an album, they'll let they'll make four songs listenable and charge 15 bucks and be like, you're either in or you're out. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. It's great. Uh, yeah, just a different model. They're not letting you sit there and get your listens in and not do anything. So, yeah. Let me see here. Uh, yeah, it was good. So that's, I'm so glad you brought them into the conversation because it's really rare you see a label where everything is just that solid. Mm -hmm. um, let me share. I wanted to bring it. This is I got a chance to talk to Andrew, who's a Philly guy, uh, about this one, Pop 1967. Uh, I really like it because it's a really good 
painting, but it's also very funny. There's also humor in this. You know, he's in bed with his cats, just laying there. And he basically, he said he took the picture of himself in this picture uh, of his cats kind of waking him up. And he just handed it to the artist. And the artist made this into the cover. Um, I, did, I, I really like it. I think it's really interesting. And yeah. sets the stage for a quirky album. It's really good. I, I have a question, PQ. Has, has any artist actually asked you, like, come to you, like, look, let me play you the music, and then I want to hear what you come up with? Or is it always for you driven by, like, the artist's vision? Um, no, I mean, some people have, get, have just sent music over and said, do what you do. Um, mm -hmm. I'm always open to that. Um, it, it's, it's always a mix. Uh, it, and it's not like it's ever, sometimes they'll just send me a photo and they say, do this in your style. They'll give me a concept and they say, do this in your style. Um, I can give you an example of where they kind of said, do what you do. Uh, Dan, would you be able to bring this up? It's um, yeah. Rashid sure. Chappelle and Buckwild, Sinners and Saints. Oh, holy smokes. Okay. That's <laughs> good stuff. Let me um, look at that. I'm just trying to get a good image here. Yeah, it's coming. But yeah, no, it's... Uh, Boom. So, and I will say, this is, it's kind of what I did when I had, when I put out my first book cover and I had a great artist, I just said like, you know what, like go nuts, do your thing. Um, and it was awesome. You know, ultimately oh, yeah. you love the artist that you're dealing with. You know, sometimes you just get out of the way and let them, let them rock. Uh, if you don't have a pure vision on yeah. Now, the other thing I, I will say, though, I don't what I don't like to do. And I'm I, I would hope to think that I'm not so pretentious to do it where I'm not the type of person where if somebody says do what you do. I will not. Um, I, can't, I like the artist to be involved in the process, even if they say do it. So I'll keep everybody involved during the sketching process and just, you know, keep them involved. Because for one, I don't want to I don't want to be so much of a douchebag that um, somebody kind of gives me something. And then I'm sitting there with my beret and, you know, working something up and then handing it over and say, I'm the artiste. What I give you is what you're going to take. I don't that, that's dumb. I mean, these guys are putting way more time into the making of this thing than I am. So I want them to feel like it's theirs. So for this particular thing, I got on a phone call with Rashid and Buckwild and they kind of told me what the album was going to address. And they sent me over some rough mixes. They gave me a few days to listen to those rough mixes. And if you listen to the album, I'll give you the example. It's very much feels like it's a, album that's taking place um kind of like how like bronx tale or do the right thing is where this album is taking place in like a three block radius you know what i mean that's what it sounds like so then i started kind of pitching them ideas and the whole concept even though it it didn't end up like this was to start off like it was going to be a mural on the side of like a bodega or something. But then we decided that we didn't want to show, you know, the brick wall or anything like that, even though it started like that, we just wanted to show the art. And um, each one of these like sort of like little vignettes in here represents each song on the album. So, mm, so awesome. I was kind of, uh, so what I did was for each one of these little images in here, I actually have the full image. So we kind of, so I drew, you know, whatever it is, 20 different images. And then I kind of like fit them into these different things so that it's, awesome. you know, you're telling a story, but 
you know, the colors are involved for this color palette wise. Um, Buck Wild and Rashid are big, uh, like polo guys. They're real, they're real into wearing like, you know, like, like exclusive polo pieces. So I kind of took the, the, uh, the color palette from, you know, the primary colors that Ralph Lauren uses on some of those, you know, high end polo pieces. And then down at the bottom where it says Sinners and Saints was just made to seem like back when we were doing the, the mural, just to seem like it's sort of, you know, like a callback to some little bit of graffiti uh, to put that in there. But that was where they kind of gave me full reign to do it, but I kept them tuned into the process the entire time. And how long did how long did the process take? Like how many months or weeks did it take you to make this cover? This took me three days. They um when so this was uh I had done a project for um a friend of mine, screw tape who um, we, we worked on a, a project for him called Soul Provider. And Screwtape is, uh, Rashid got tapped into my work from doing that. So um, I, he, he hit me up and said, you know, would you be available to do something? I'm doing an album with Buck Wild, who Buck Wild somebody that I've, you know, looked up to as a producer for close to 30 years. So I was really, really geeked on that. Um, and when I got on the phone with them, we talked and they said, there's only one caveat. We need, would you be able to deliver the art within, uh, the, I think at the time it was about eight days that they needed it. So I wanted to get that done. I basically cleared my entire plate because I want it to be on this project a lot. Right, right. And um, and I wanted to give myself some room to where if they wanted something changed, I wasn't at the last minute trying to, you know, square this thing away. So um, so I, I you know, I I really I spent all my time on that to get it done. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. No, yeah. It, it, yeah, no, the, you were when you were describing the process that reminded of of working with LSB on my logo because I didn't have a vision of any, <laughs> and I just he said, you know, what logos do you like? To send him some, and he came back to me with directions. Right, direction number one, we could go over here. Direction number two, we could go over here. Direction number three, we could go over here, and. He let me, he, oh, he was always asking me questions and being like, you know, which direction do you like? You know, which, and so that allowed me to be in the process as it went along and feel vested in the outcome. Yeah. Yeah. So. And, and, you know, that's something that I think um, people should really pay attention to. I mean, from, from the artist and designer standpoint, everybody should really know that. But then when it comes to working with, um, you know, who, whoever your quote unquote client is that you're working with, the, the person that you're doing the work for, what they are doing, whether it's a business or whether it's music or, you know, um, whatever it is they're doing, they're really what makes the logo. The logo has to be, or the artwork has to be aesthetically pleasing to a certain extent, but like, let's put it this way, if um, the Nike swoosh would just be anything, if but then it was a global brand that made the swoosh the swoosh. The swoosh didn't make Nike the brand, you know what mm. I mean? It's, it, it should be enough to inspire the person to want to use it, but then yeah. it's it's got to be the movement that really makes, that really takes a hold of it. Good point. Yeah. yeah. The... Uh... K Diggy, I want to show this is my hands down my favorite album cover of the year. No questions. And this is not going to be something a lot of people are going to tell you is the best album cover of the year. But Egyptian Lovers 1986. <laughs> I love this cover. I can't get enough of this cover. Uh, it's something that I love, but like me and my son can laugh and enjoy. Like, 
uh, it's just it's great for me. But well, it, it's cool, man. Like it's just a cool cover. Yeah. And what about it? Like connected with you? I mean, well, I guess it's like the special. Like obviously, it's just a beautiful picture, right? It's a beautiful art. Mm-hmm. I think it's really well done. But inside this kind of pristine picture, something insane is happening, right? Like there's <laughs> a spaceship head that is flying. Um, and so that is, that's magnificent. And, there, it, it, and it sets the tone. 1986 is very like 80s dance music, hip hop, but almost like, Morris Day in the Time kind of feel mm-hmm. to some of the songs. Uh, so this cover is perfect for what that album is. I think uh, what makes this so cool too is like, you know, you have the story of Egyptian lover. So when you when you bring that in and then he was sort of like reintroduced to a younger generation through when peanut butter wolf started trying to put out his stuff through stone's throw and it it makes it so that you know like this cover and going back like like the music's awesome but by by enjoying the music you're also there's a certain level of it where you're kind of like embracing the absurd Mm -hmm. and that's kind of what the cover is but it's great you know what i mean there's it's it's not a uh it's like egyptian lover is in on what we are in on by appreciating it you know what i mean Mm -hmm. it's not uh, i I don't know a better way to say that like no i think you i think you're right because 1986 is him pushing his chest out and being like i've been here a while i've been doing this yes um and and you you can't use it against me. It's worth it, right? Yeah. You know, I've been there. You weren't there, um, and that's that's cool. You know, I being able to f- reframe your age is really important. We talked about that with the the Ka record, uh, mm-hmm. the, the new Ka album, being able to kind of posit and position your maturity as as a positive thing rather than you know you old now. So yeah. Yep. So, PQ, do you have any like all time favorites? Ramel Z is, is a strong candidate uh, for, for the best one uh, you brought in. Do you, do you have anything else that you were thinking of? Um, for 2021 or my favorites in general? 2021. 2021. Okay. Um, I really like from, you know, this, this is pretty recent the Alchemist and Boldy James Bo Jackson cover. Ooh, we got to look mm. at it. It is, by the way, Alchemist. Uh, Alchemist has a run going of really cool covers. Yeah. And you know what? I think something with Alchemist is um, how, what I just said, embracing the absurd. He kind of does that with everything. You know, he makes really, really uh, hard music, but he is like, a pretty he kind of presents himself as a pretty quirky guy so if you were to see i don't know if you guys saw when this when this cover came out came out it has obviously the branding and the fonts from nike um yep. you know like you know so, so that that bo jackson shoe is a classic shoe and then alchemist posted a video of him creating the cover which is basically him taking a bunch of different Bo Jackson cards and slicing them up into these strips and then kind of like shifting them around. Wow. So it's an intriguing thing because it's abstract, but you can kind you you can see that something's going on. It's not just you like can paint with splatter the on a page. You can see the yes. lettering behind yeah. the thing. Yeah. You can find the picture. Yeah. So I, I think that's a really cool one. Because at first it doesn't look like, it just looks like cool colors, you know. Uh, yeah. But when you you look at it, it really starts to form and shape. That's that's excellent. Yeah. And I think something um, for for my approach when I do covers for people, and I 
even though I don't want to, I like to appreciate stuff that's not my style. I kind of like when somebody has this approach in that I started out as, um, before I was doing covers, I was making beats. Mm -hmm. So I look for the stuff. I try to make the stuff that's akin to what I would look for when I'm digging for samples. So I'm going to go in and there's some stuff, you know, obviously you have to have knowledge of musicians and record labels and things like that when you're digging for beats. But sometimes, you know, you, th there's these tropes in, in record digging that you can kind of go for, you know what I mean? If you, people buy something, if there's a, a man or woman with an Afro on the cover, or if yeah, there's right. a naked lady on the cover, you're getting that. But I kind of go for the things that are drawn in, you know, um, to go back to that childish Gambino, it's like that parliament funkadelic thing where it's like these bright psychedelic colors. And if I can kind of tap into that, I want to, my goal is to get something that is eye catching from the beginning, but to go back to that Egyptian lover. So those bright colors, but then you can listen to the record. And if you have it on vinyl or CD, or even if you're just looking at it on your phone, you can kind of zoom in and start to see like, all right, what's going on in here and what are some of these other things that are, that's happening that we can kind of like use to beautiful. Yeah. I, I was looking at this earlier. Um, same thing, you know, you, you're looking at all colors and then you can kind of just start to tell yourself the story of what's going on when you're seeing this. Yeah. For the, for the audio people, we, we just switched to talking about, Dave, we're all alone in this together. Uh, so it, it's a great example of what you're talking about, where, you, where when you first look at it, you're drawn to these kind of bright pink, purple colors, mm -hmm. and it pulls you to the boat, right? It pulls you to the center where you see the boat, and you wonder what's going on in the boat. And now you see the letter, and we're all alone in this together, and you're like, oh, wow, okay. Uh, so that really sets the emotional stage for the album. Yeah. Uh, and it's obviously, he's very happy with that, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, that's not, uh, that's, that's an important part of it. And one of the last, like in terms of closing remarks, right? One of my closing remarks would be as, as an artist if, of another ilk, right? Uh, like when I was putting out, putting together my book, I didn't feel like I knew anything about art. So I felt weird about giving thoughts on it. You know, uh, mm -hmm. you have to give your permission, give permission to yourself to like move it in the right direction that you want, whether you feel like, you know, art or not, you're going to live with this cover for the rest of your days. Yeah. So you better be in on the decision making. You better be full hands on. And I think something to be said, too, when you're dealing with album art, um, I don't I personally do not like to take myself or my artwork over seriously just because it's you know, it, it turns people off. So when somebody is doing something, you know, if, if you're dealing with an artist, if, if you're making a record and you're dealing with a visual artist, I think it's like that's where you have it's good to have that balance of, for me, I don't want to be micromanaged when I'm creating this thing, but at the same time, I don't want to feel like I'm out on an island drawing this thing and then I'm going to present it to them at the very, you know, I, I want it to almost, I'm not delusional to think that I'm part of the group or the record making process, right, right. But, but at the same time, it's like, all right, come on, man. We're a team. Like, let's mm. let, let's see. Let's have some conversation around this. And you know, like some some people, it, it's sort of like. Remember when, in the early two thousands, when the Neptunes were having their run and they yep. were just killing everything on the radio. Mm -hmm. They but but then they're making the stuff for Nori and making the stuff for Jay. And then they're innovating their sound when they're doing that. But then people are still wanting the stuff that they did for Nori or for Jay. And it's like, we already did that. Like they, you know, at one point Pharrell 
probably could have just everything that he made could have just got sent out to a label, but he didn't want to do that. He wanted to be sitting with an artist and working with them. And you know what I mean? Like, let's develop a sound, let's develop an ethos. Let's, let's see what we're referencing. Cause you know, he's getting that commercial sound, but it's all dated back to like tribe records. And he's trying to recreate that. When you're an artist doing that, you don't want to have somebody just say, all right, here's, you know, just do your thing. And then, I don't want to feel like whatever I'm handing over to somebody right. they're just willingly taking whatever, you know what I mean? I, I want it to be somewhat of a collaborative process. Right. You're, you're more process oriented than product oriented. Like your, your reward is the process and the journey to the, to the final destination slash product. Yeah. I mean, uh, partly that. And then, so to, to even speak to that, there's, there's artists that I'm, I'm a fan of right now that are, you know, making music right now. And I like what they do. And I guess on one hand, if they were to reach out to me and they want it, they want it artwork because mm-hmm. I've, you know, like we have mutual respect for each other. I would say yes, but then I'm not chasing them down to work with them because when the way that I work, when I'm doing something for somebody, even though I'm not in the studio with them and whether or not they're sharing rough mixes with me or anything, when I'm making the cover, there's a small part of it where it's like, you're kind of seeing how the sausage is being made. Right, right. And some of these artists, I just want to be a fan. You know what I mean? I want to yeah. see, I want to see a, a, a finished product delivered to me because I'm such a fan of these guys. I'm a fan of them the way that I was a fan of doom or, you know, the, the, the early Wu Tang records or something like that, where it's like, I just want to sit there and appreciate this as a fan because I've, I've been very, very fortunate for the last, you know, two years to really work with a lot of people who I highly, highly, excuse me, respect, but just naturally when the album comes out and everybody else is hearing it, you kind of can't hear it the same way because you've gotten to see how it's been made. And there's some stuff that I've done that, um, like say Sinners and Saints, the the Rashid and Buckwild album, I'm just getting to really, really appreciate that as a fan now. And it's been almost a year because I was, I was able to see how, you know, people were reacting to it and it was awesome to see because, you know, they're, they're good guys and, they, they, they're super super talented they made a great project um but you just yeah, i know it's it's just natural like right. when you're part of the you're creative so process you're not going to hear it the same way that a fan would yeah right you're mm-hmm. so close to it you you had to get some distance that makes sense yes yeah, yeah. I, to build on the neptunes thing because i think the strangely enough when i think of the neptunes i think of mad lib on the other side of that mm-hmm. because they were both kind of production engines that always pushed forward right always pushing forward and so you knew when mad lib releases a beat tape that's all about brazil because he's in brazil like he's not just like this isn't just like a ooh, i'm in brazil he's learning right yes he's like enjoying learning about the music and the culture and he's processing it through himself so he's like come on the wagon we're all going to learn together right like and that's kind of the feeling you wanted like we're we're going to be a team cuz you're going to learn more about what you like in cover art and I'm going to learn more about your process we're going to learn together right yeah um, and so it's just better that um, it seems yeah yeah and and with someone like Madlib I think I'm, I'm super envious of him because for one, it's almost like he's done some of these amazing records, you know, like whether it's with doom or whether it's like the stuff with Freddie Gibbs, but Mad Lib is so prolific where if you were to tell me that Mad Lib has never heard Pinata, it wouldn't surprise me. You know what I mean? It's just like, I just feel like the dude wakes up and is just making music for like 18 hours a day. <laughs> and it's whatever gets made he makes it dumps it to tape 
and then it's sent off and then that's he's got the people you know egon or whoever who's just like facilitating how that's getting sent to artists and stuff i you know he's a super mysterious dude and i always wonder that like i can't picture him being in there with somebody just uh like like overthinking how high the snare is in the mix you know what I mean? it's just like yeah. he's making the shit he's super confident on how it's getting put out yeah no uh, k diggy to talk about quasimodo a little bit about the mysterious stuff like he released this album under a totally different name this was like early early 2000s like i was in the military and he had pitched his voice up to such a crazy degree that that people didn't really know it was him and he was rapping right so he totally changed the way his voice was through artificial stuff, produced it himself, called it Quasimodo, and this is the cover. And so when you look at look at Mad Lib Bandana, look at who's on top of the zebra. <laughs> it's the Quasimodo. It's the Quasimodo figure that is now on a zebra watching Hollywood burn. Um, so he created this iconic uh, creature thing that can follow him for the rest of his career if he wants. That will yeah. be part of him and associated with it. Yeah. And, you know, shout out to uh, Jeff Jank from Stone's Throw who created the Quas cartoon character oh, wow. um he kind of provided in the same way that um that uh we were talking about ryan puma doing um the oh wow you're bringing up my favorite album what was the i was trying to think of the the, the follow-up what was the um is it uh opera um spanish Rain album covers uh Aha, Danger Blue. Yes, Danger Blue. Because look at Danger Blue. Danger Blue has the Quasimodo figure in the back. Yeah. The Doom figure in the back, right? So this gives you a real understanding. And Blue's in the front, right? Uh, yeah. Driving the car, pointing to Godzilla or whatever. And uh, <laughs> this is, yeah, Danger Blue. It, it, so when we see that Quasimodo, we know exactly what that is, right? We, we know exactly what the Doom figure is. Like, we really are very lucky to have this kind of iconography yes. uh, in our history that we can keep, keep dealing with. Yeah, and for the record, when I was saying a few minutes ago about how I just want to be a fan of people because I love their music so much, I was actually referring to these guys. Banish Red, the whole clique. It's it's it reminds me a lot of sort of an an East Coast version of a mix of uh, that early two thousand Stones throw and then also what Alchemist is doing where he's just got that sort of studio and you, you never know who's going to roll through there and I feel like these guys have something really really special and the way that uh, uh, the artist that does a lot of their artwork his name is Dwayne Plains and shout out to him because I'm a I'm a big fan. Awesome. That is good stuff. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think we covered what I wanted to cover. Uh, Katie, do you have anything else you wanted to hit on? No, no. I think we did a very extensive job tonight. So let's go recommendation corner because it's coming up. Bandcamp Friday's coming up. We got to give the people what they want. Mm -hmm. uh, so trying to think because I just I just posted a column Let me, you know what I just posted a column today for the FME enthusiasts recommending specific uh, band camp stuff so I'll keep away from that I would say shout out we, Big Flowers did a great piece earlier in the week about Passion of the Weiss Records right uh, Passion of the Weiss Records has been doing incredible work and Archibald Slim just released an album called Fell Asleep Praying on the 26th. Uh, 11 tracks, 
from Atlanta. Really dope. Uh, yeah, check check him out. Uh, yeah, follow Passion of the Weiss recordings on Bandcamp because they're always releasing something interesting. K Diggy, they did the Gabe Nandez. Oh no, Gabe Nandez, who did the Gabe Nandez Seven. He he's on that label as well. He's released stuff on that label. So okay. Um, yeah, they do great stuff. Fat Boy Sharif, Gandhi loves children. So um, that's good stuff. Shout out Sharif. Oh Sharif. So Pinky, do you have anything you rec you want to recommend? Um, yeah, I would definitely recommend um, anything produced by Spanish Ran. Um, but also specifically the blue and Spanish ran stuff is something that I've been really, really tapped into uh, for the last couple months. It's probably my, it, it's definitely my favorite stuff that's out right now. Um, the oh. new, uh, just for stuff that I've worked on, um, Zillaraca, Vegas Vic. Ooh, Vegas Vic. Um, if you haven't tapped into that and some stuff that came out last year from Screwtape, um, his EP Soul Provider and his EP Talk to Me Nice. Um, mm -hmm. I had the privilege of working with him on both of those uh, amazing productions. Screw Tape's amazingly talented, uh, super super dope lyricist. So I would I would go in there. And if you love Vegas Vic, go to the Free Music Empire YouTube channel. The interview that I did with with Zilla is unbelievable. Zilla's interviews are fabulous. They cover so much. Uh, I describe somebody who just can't stop figuring things out. Uh, so he's just, he's always on. Uh, okay, Diggy, do you have anything to recommend that he's no. been mowing you? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no recommendations this, this week. Ben Mo K Diggy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, get it done. So, but yeah, I would say it's it. Be be thankful for this, and do not let, uh, do not let how good this era is fight a different era. Right? Do not let somebody say, "Oh, this is better than the '90s." Let's have them fight. The '90s gave us this era, right? Absolutely. So be happy we had the '90s. Be happy we have this now. Uh, yell at less people. Okay. <laughs> 